So our last speaker for this session is uh, Dr. Kasper Aman, and a couple of things I'd like you to know about uh, Dr. Aman is, first, he's a climate scientist who was trained at, uh, in PhD in geosciences from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. He's right now a researcher at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And he was one of the contributing authors to the IPCC Fourth Assessment Report. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Kasper Aman. Thank you. And I'm going to hook up my computer because I have some movies that I would like to share with you. Good morning. Um, the previous speaker was saying something about being an odd duckling. I am definitely a very odd duckling here in this lineup, even more so, and uh, will probably not turn out to be the shiny swan, but maybe a worm or a rhino or whatever. <laughs> it, the climate will connect to your application. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a climate scientist, and I come here essentially with an offer to you. The climate research community has had a, a challenge which was to show and underline what we understand about the climate system and if climate change is A, indeed happening, and what are the causes underneath of these trends that we are observing. And we are observing them around the world. And so the debate, if this is internal climate variability or if it might be actually man-made, this has been you know, dominating climate change science for the last two decades. But I think, and I hope to show you just a few little things here, we have reached a point where with high confidence, we can tell you that these global changes that are happening, the global trends, their distribution in space, both horizontally but also vertically in the atmosphere, we can fingerprint them as the result of the changes in the concentration of greenhouse gases. After that, having now done this, and having built really elaborate tools to represent the physics, the biogeochemistry underneath of this planet, we now can use these tools to actually answer some more useful questions. And these are the questions that you are all facing of climate and weather variability and the changes that you are facing if you want to go with into a future planet with a much higher population, with different technologies, and now also an underlying climate that starts shifting. Can we, from the climate science community, offer you useful information that allow you to go on that path with better information, to be better prepared for some of the local and regional and global challenges that you're going to face that are essentially inescapable. So that's the a slightly new orientation in the climate research community, and I'm representing one part of this group. I have been uh, involved in helping to build the climate models, but now we are trying to translate what the climate models offer for you. And so this is what we are trying to, to do, is to connect to you and learning what specific characteristics of the climate you are sensitive to with your applications, with your uh, management systems, and could we inform you in various timescales, from seasonal to longer timescales, on that path towards a sustainable um, performance? What I would like to do is break this down in a few subtopics, quickly talk a little bit about data, what is there and what our tools offer specifically. I will bring up the topic of evaluation. Evaluation here, not in the sense of how we as metrologists and geoscientists are looking at these models. Is the precipitation on a global basis correct? But what are the characteristics that you would like? Can we build evaluations if the key timing, the key sequence of certain events that make all the difference in your applications, if they are actually in the model, something that has never been asked, and I'm asking you here as a representation of the agricultural community, but you can also see the same is true for transportation, for health, for 
water resources, for any other application that you can think of. We need to learn to expose the climate models to the questions and challenges from the applications. So far, we have done it mostly from the metrological and climatological perspective. So here's a change in evaluation. And then comes the, set, the, the third part. We have of the order of up to 50 climate models, global climate models around the world from different centers, 30 plus centers around the world that build global coupled climate models. They have been run for many different scenarios along many different initialization paths forward into the future. And we can get you, if you would like that, about 20 petabyte of climate data if you want. This is absolutely useless to you, I would think. But we could give you all this data. But how do you take that? How would you have to translate what is there, retaining the knowledge that is behind this data so that it actually fits to the needs and the worries that, that you have to manage? So that's this component about translation. And that leads then to where we actually have to go. Where on the, you see this bridge there, this is at Hoover Dam where they built the new bridge and I took one, uh, one image there from the web that illustrates there are these two worlds. One is for me here the climate community of course, the climate research tools and on the other side is where the applications are, the needs where the data, the knowledge and the, the tools should make a difference. We need to from both sides get closer to each other, start to learn each other's language, and start to connect. And that's what the objective is of this talk, is to connect with you. And hopefully, um, we will have some follow-up conversations that we can better tune our information to your needs. You can ask better climate questions, and we can both improve on our sides, our models on one side, and you and your planning pathway. So that's the, the breakdown that I would like to do. And given that there were um, very efficient speakers ahead of me. I put two slides additional in because I saw a little bit more space because I had to be very brief about f a few of the concepts. So bear with me if I'm going a little longer than the other um, presentations, but I hope not too much over. Here is the first tool that you see every day in your weather forecast on the TV. What you see on the left side is on the, on the upper part is the forecast of a day and a half of a storm system very similar to what just um, went through our country um, the, the last couple days. On the right side is what the radar in the real world actually measured. So this is an initialized weather forecast where you can see that once you initialize a weather model, we have very good capabilities in forecasting both the shape in space, but also the timing of when some of these lines of thunderstorms are coming to particular areas. That's weather forecasting. At the bottom, you see an example of Hurricane Katrina, which we actually started to predict at NCAR four days in advance, both the strength and the path for Hurricane Katrina going towards New Orleans. What I want to illustrate with this is on the short time scales, the tools that we are using for weather forecasting, they have progressed tremendously in the last decades. And you have probably in your area noticed that these, these forecasts have improved and we can push out the forecasts many more days than we used to, close to in some areas to maybe 10 days. Some attempts go beyond theoretical limits, exist to about two weeks and beyond that chaos takes over. It is, it's part of the system, it's, it's a theoretical limit. But then comes the, come the climate model tools, and the climate model tools are different, and I really need to illustrate that for you just a little bit and in a couple of other slides later on as well. The concept is different, because we don't necessarily initialize with what is the situation right now. We say the climate of the present time is on average this. And you see here a simulation of a model that can run for present climate for a thousand years, however long you want. There is nothing else that goes into the model other than the sun and its solar radiation. The earth rotates. The continents are specified where they are. There is a vegetation that is somewhere on this planet. And there's greenhouse gases and aerosol in this atmosphere. That's it. 
The rest, the model predicts and it evolves. It has internal variability, it has weather, it has El Nino events that come and go, all of the key characteristics that cause year to year, season to season, and even day to day fluctuations. They're in there. Most of the models operate at the resolution that you see on top. It's fairly coarse resolution so that we can efficiently run for hundreds or thousands of years if we would like to. As a climate model, we are not necessarily interested in any individual day, but the sequence, the collection of years, and what the characteristics are underneath. We can take these models and push them towards the resolution of the weather forecast models. You see that at the bottom where you start to get actually resolving hurricanes. You can get individual storm fronts that don't look very dissimilar from what you get from a weather forecast model. We could do that too for thousands of years, but then instead of handing you to pe uh, 20 petabyte, we would go into exabyte. So the number of data is going up enormously. And that's where, of course, the limitations are. Two small illustrations, if we would push towards about 25 kilometer, which you see at the bottom, we can resolve hurricanes. Are they the best hurricanes and are they therefore, you know, good prediction tools? Not quite, but we have th storms in there that rotate strongly and have propagate just as we see in hurricanes in the real world. But more importantly for us, for the climate questions, are things, when I'm showing you here, the sea surface temperatures in the Pacific. They are the variations in, in that Pacific Ocean Basin are the biggest variations in climate from year to year, El Nino events. I'm, I hope most of you are familiar with that term. This is the, bit, the cause of the biggest amount of interannual climate variability, not only in the Pacific itself, but it's as teleconnections, how we call it, to the high latitudes. And therefore, even in Iowa, in Europe, in Asia, the climate is dependent on the state of what the Pacific does. The climate models nowadays, and this is in the latest round of these Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change coordinated experiments, they can resolve both the spatial structure but also a good part of the statistics from year to year of variations of El Nino. In earlier, uh, earlier generations, that was not the case and therefore there were a whole lot of cascading errors because it didn't quite resolve the variability in the Pacific. So we have progressed there too. And now I would like to show you just a few key images that summarize where we are in the climate change discussion. Here the IPCC AR5, the fifth assessment report just published last year and for the other working groups that are not the physical climate science but the impacts, they're being published um, essentially as we speak. You see on the left side the, the cover for this physical science base is where the climate models are in there, and on the right side, I would say the key takeaway figures that since two decades have dominated the climate discussion. The top one is the radiative forcing. As we change the concentration of greenhouse gases, how much heat is essentially retained towards the surface of this planet. And what you see this line going up, the red line, uh, is a projection if we keep going with emissions of greenhouse gases as we have in the last 150 to 250 years. The black line shows the history of, of that. And the blue line going forward, uh, flattening out, would be a scenario where essentially in the very near future we would start to reduce our emissions. These are two scenarios and for the climate models these are just what if scenarios. Doesn't, there's no claim that any of these is better. It's just if you would follow a path like that in terms of emissions, now we're going to simulate what the response is. And the second um, graph there is surface air temperature response, and I think you have seen those in the press uh, probably as well, and you see how this response is very closely tied to the radiative forcing. If we change that blanket, the thickness of the blanket, the response underneath is really responding to it. And at the bottom is that it's not only the temperature that is changing, and that's really where global climate change comes in, but the hydrologic cycle is changing. So the precipitation rates are also going to change on a global basis. That's, these are the main figures that have been discussed. And if you want to have in parallel to the main figure the key sentence, look at the 
Last sentence in this little snapshot there. It is extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid 20th century. This is the sentence that has been, over the last two decades, been constrained and constrained and constrained. The wording has gotten tighter and tighter, and there's a lot of politics behind that, but this is what the scientific community can offer you now. So that's what I said at the beginning. We are at the place where we can say it is extremely likely of what you are seeing on a global basis is due to greenhouse gas changes. So let's look now into space, and that's where it becomes more interesting. First, on the global perspective of temperature, surface temperature changes mean and uh, precipitation, you see the maps on the left side, that scenario that is, uh, that is lower, that would be in response to a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in the, in the very near future. And on the right side, temperature on top and precipitation at the bottom, the changes that we would have to expect by the end of the 21st century if we keep emitting pretty much as we have been in the, in the past. So an increase in, in these emissions. And you see the temperature changes there in degrees Celsius. So when you see the dark red, it goes from 7 to 12 degrees Celsius, multiply that by 2 to get to Fahrenheit as a close number. These are very large numbers of change. And just to give you as a background the geologic number that we now have for glacial interglacial change, Iowa being covered sometimes by ice, not in all of them, but sometimes, and where we are pretty much in pre-industrial time today, close to today, is globally about five degrees Celsius. With these numbers at the, on the right side, within 100 years, we can get the same change within 100 years. That's what the model average has. There are models that are higher, there are models that are a little bit lower. But this is just, it is a large number, and it's geologically for the planet of significance. It's not just a change that one can feel or not. I'm going to go very brief so that you get an idea of how these ensembles, these groups, come together. And I mentioned we can run a climate model at any particular state. That means we give the greenhouse gas concentrations and the population where there's land use of a particular type, cities versus um, forests, primary forests, or if there is um, agricultural land. And then we can branch off somewhere, let's say on a January 1st, and when any particular year, and we declare this snapshot to be January 1st of 1870, for example. And then from that day on, we evolve the history, or we evolve the greenhouse gases as they did, or as we have observed over the last 130 or 140 years. And we want to see if the climate model, now going with a timestamp in it, going forward, can reproduce what has been observed. And we can do this many times. We can branch off that background climate where it's just weather changing many times. And at the end of those, they all would represent possible 20th century-like simulations. And at the end of those, we can then say, we can now go into the future and we go different scenarios, very high emissions or these, um, these lower emission scenarios. And we can do this for all. And then we average those. And that's when you end up to, with things like this. And now I show you a couple of figures that are no longer mean temperature for the year. But what about if we look at the coldest daily temperature in, uh, over the planet, as you see at the top, top part, with the map of what we have to expect in the high emission scenario. So how the coldest day in any location is expected to change based on 18 different models that have daily resolution, uh, that have delivered data with daily resolution. And if you look at Iowa, it is in the dark, dark colors. I would say by the end of the 21st century, we're going to be at about 10 degrees, that the coldest day is going to be warmer than anything that you would see today. At the bottom is the same for the warmest daily maximum temperature. And there, the increase is of the order of maybe 7 degrees Celsius for the peak temperature. You can take this as a little exercise, but at, at the moment, when you put this to you, towards your crop models, at the moment that you put that towards your livestock 
and try to see how livestock would deal with the significantly higher, suddenly, daily peak temperatures, you will start to see the, the significance. On the right side, for both of these um, questions, there is the time series for the different scenarios that you see, how, when and how much, um, for example, the difference could be if we would start to reduce emissions in the near future, how much of a change we would expect for that, and uh, when that separation would be achieved. A second thing that I'm just throwing on and not, not going to discuss much more is the number of frost days we can, of course, also pull out. And that might not necessarily be so important for corn, but it might be very important for apples and other fruit trees where this winter um, cold condition, the winter cold conditions are absolutely critical, that they will tell you if you can actually get fruit or not. So cold days or tropical nights. Tropical nights might also be, we can do this also for the summer, summer period where the nighttime um, relaxation in, in, in vegetation could be critical. And we can start to draw from our models what we would expect the changes at nighttime can be and how the impacts then would be on your crops. That would be an interesting thing to look at. A little bit into hydrology. And another, another type, rather than just looking at these maxima or minima or averages of these, what is also fairly often important is sequences of particular events. So for example, five day cumulative rainfall. If you take a sequence of five days and the total rainfall in that, which often leads to really super saturated soils, flooding and so on, it doesn't really matter how much exactly it rains in each individual day, but when we have a five day sequence, there is a limitation in how much the soils can respond and, and buffer that water away. So here is a change that, or changes that we would expect, again, on that high-end scenario. And on the right side, you see there um, the time series for the other scenarios a little bit in perspective. But we are talking about 10 to 25% more rain in a five-day sequence in the middle latitudes. Look at Africa, look Southeast Asia. 25% more rain, if you do get the, a five-day sequence of rainfall, 25% more. That is a substantial number. And if you manage to change seeds to deal with temperature, there's also a hydrologic component to it. We need to think about you know, how, when, there is, when it's raining, these five-day sequences, for example, can start to flush away a lot of nutrients, for example, or other effects that are there. So we need to start to ask the climate models for things like this. And I would hope that in that conversation with you, we can identify many more of these type of things that we so far never really pull out of the climate models and therefore not, don't test. At the bottom, the equivalent, but on the dry side, the consecutive lengths of of dry days when there, there's no rainfall or uh, for minimal rainfall that is not useful for vegetation. You often use something like 0.1 millimeter or 0.5 millimeters or something like this depending where you are and what crop you look for, that threshold might be slightly different. But we can pull these things out and try to tell you how much we understand about the possible changes of these sequences of things. But we need to learn from you what that is. But when you take these two things as an example, that you come up with this almost strange conclusion that in the intraseasonal variability, when we go into the future, when it's wet, it's getting wetter. Yet when it's dry, it actually gets quite a bit drier. And it's, it's very simple. With higher temperatures, the carrying capacity of air of bringing moisture along simply goes up exponentially. 7% with every degree Celsius of temperature, we can bring more moisture with it. And if you saturate that air to the maximum capacity, it's simply going to rain more. At the same time, when temperatures are higher, the evaporation out of the soils is higher. Therefore, the feedback that you normally have, wet soils evaporate, cool a little bit, but they keep the system going and it's kind of balanced. Once the soils are dry and they get dry faster when at higher temperature, the moisture is away, that feedback starts to break down and we get drier and drier climates. So it gets drier in, in these subtropical and even into the mid-latitude, southern mid-latitude areas. But when it then rains, 
it, rain, it can rain really hard. So we have, we have, we're talking about the availability of this data. This data is freely available, but it's not really useful to you because the formats, the volumes, the multiple models that are there is very hard to manage. So a couple of challenges, uh, and I have a few keywords there at the bottom, but let me just go into that. Um, first is the different climate models. Not every climate model is good for all the different processes. And we have started to do some comparisons. Instead of just throwing all of the models into one basket and averaging, we are starting to develop these metrics that tell us how good are these models. And given one of these metrics, which is a metric that tries to take temperature and precipitation both spatially and it's in its interannual variability, one thing we are very happy to see is that over the last decade, from the second assessment report, uh, the third assessment report, these numbers are a little bit out of order with the assessment reports, but the last three assessment reports have seen a progression of increasing the quality of these models, both in average, but also in most of the individual ones. So the top, these, what you see is error bars of two um, assessment reports back, then one back, and this is the, AO, the CMIP-5 is equivalent with our, the data for our latest report, the error bars get smaller and smaller. The red lines show you the overall multimodal average, how these things are improving. That's a good, it's a good sign. But I would claim that if we could start to bring metrics from your community in, from the health side, from agriculture, from, wa from water, from transportation, we could start to improve these even further because we are looking at only very specific things that a metrologist would look at. So the new focus is really, I think, on impact. And here come a couple of challenges, and that's where that image before was actually not that bad. What happens at the moment is that you have a global climate modeler, maybe like I used to be, hand you some data. Then you have people that deal at the regional scale with weather, and they take this data and use maybe a weather-like model to downscale or statistical techniques to downscale to much more appropriate scales for applications. But what happens is that it's almost a blind handover, a black box that gets to be the boundary conditions for that higher resolution thing. Then that modeler or that person that has downscaled this climate data hands it to a process modeler. And the process modeler takes that again as a black box, temperature, precip, and all this, and then runs their model and knows everything about that model but has lost what the knowledge was for the downscaling and definitely has lost what the knowledge was from the global models. And that is dangerous because there are a number of assumptions, there are a number of pieces of knowledge. I know that for the earlier models, El Nino was not good. So everybody that takes this data really needs to know that and maybe needs to guard against it. So we need in this progression of the handing over of this data and how it's used, we need to build bridges. The key pieces of information need to be handed along and make sure that we are aware of it and we can translate this properly. So I briefly go over these. The data is accessible, but probably not in a format that you can directly take it and actually do something useful with it. We need to identify what indices, what key characteristics can we generate for you. Evaluation, if we hand you data, what are the key metrics that you would like to see if this data is actually any good for you before you plug it into any of your applications? It would help you, but it also helps us in the development of the models. Translation, what key assumptions are we going after or are, are affecting our um, interpretations when we pull, uh, pull data out of an archive and then make this string. This is a, a big, big problem. How do you bring all that knowledge together and then translate what it means for somebody who simply wants to know how much, how many days is it going to be really above 30 degrees Celsius, which is going to hit our corn or the grain production really hard. We need to start to form communities of practice in order to really 
ensure that this exchange happens. And at the moment, this is done a little bit like this image shows. It's kind of a bit of a square peg that we try to hammer into a round hole. We can do some solutions. We can get there, and we can do good work to improve this, but it's not the ideal. So Apollo 13 had the ch same challenge with a square and a round hole with their CO2 filters, and they, they found a solution, and we can find solutions for our applications too, but it's not ideal. If we want this operationally and really better for the future, we need this um, to work better. So is there an app for that? And now the question really comes, can we build such an app? And I'm going to race through. At the moment, not yet, but the moment you get something, there might be an app that claims to give you the solution. But you have to be careful, and you have, should ask always, is behind the beautiful map that you're getting of a change, can you trace back how this was produced, how it was evaluated, what the assumptions were, and if these assumptions along this chain might have fundamental effects on the outcome that you are now facing with the map. And the climate data that I've seen for development agencies and so on is often not up to the snuff. And I would say this is the situation that we are living under. And we as the research community need to better connect to this world out here that tries to find solution in the real world. So we need to get over these guys. We need all are aware that precipitation is not just precipitation. There are many different types. If you're in a monsoon system, a flash flood, or droughts, the characteristics are different. And we need to test differently. It's not just the average. We can do downscaling, and uh, if this works, then you can say we can feed a, uh, a model. This should, this should actually be a movie, but it doesn't seem to work. Um, embed a really high-resolution model inside a GCM, a global climate model, but you're going to be the slave of what the out, outside boundary tell, gives you. <laughs> And we need to be aware of it. So new developments are, are being done right now to essentially take some of these steps away and focus in on the key areas to provide solutions that don't suffer from this multiple handover and bla of black boxes. But they, they can zoom in right the way towards uh, the resolutions and characteristics that are needed. If you should go to some of the data distributions, here is from the exact same global climate model. It's a GFDL model. Five different ways of downscaling, and what we're looking at is the maximum temperature in July. Look at these maps. It doesn't matter that you can read much, but you see quite a bit of differences. If you pick one, you better be aware which one you pick. And what does the average mean between all of those? If this is supposed to be climate, we have to learn to ask these questions a little bit critically. And I like to do this sometimes with, with people. I say, well, one is just we roll the dice. It's just probability. And what we're interested in is the average. Yet when you go play somewhere, the average is not what you're shooting for all the time. You make particular bets. And then there comes you know, Harrison Ford there on the right side who says, don't tell me what the likelihood is. I might do something that is not even in the, in the dice. I'm going to do something completely different. And sometimes, this is for your applications, the critical thing. There are some thresholds that you cannot surpass because everything will break down. You're going to lose the livelihood and so on. So particular thresholds. And we need to learn to assess the climate models. How good are we for the means? Sure. But how good are we for talking about these thresholds? And that, the quality between these two might be vastly different. And we need to look at this more carefully. We can do this at any place around the world, the means or the tails of the distributions. I pulled here an example from Southeast Asia. And then there comes this, this thing about the sequence again. Not only what you do in one roll of a dice, but the sequence. And here is just an illustration of trying to say, depending on your application, Sequence means something completely different. It could be something on a seasonal scale that you need to know at the moment when you put in your seeds into the ground, you are not allowed to have too much water because you can't go in with heavy machinery in Iowa, for example. But in other places, it is when you, before harvest when the biggest sensitivity is. Or, you know, it's time dependent along a path that your particular sensitivities are. 
And we need to learn from that because generally we say something in the annual cycle looks good, the average change over the, ne over the next 10 years is X and so on. So Gene Tackley sent me this and it's a decision wheel for agriculture that for us in the climate world illustrates quite nicely when along the seasonal cycle certain decisions are being made. When seed decisions are being made, when seed is purchased and when the seed actually goes into the ground. We need more of these examples. I think this is a beautiful diagram illustrating a certain aspect of the agricultural decision chain towards people like me. And if we can do more of those, I think we can start to deliver better information to you. The decadal prediction is a whole different thing. So what the climate world is trying to do, and you're going to get some messages in the news these days or in the next few months, about how we try to predict the next years and the next 10 years, up to a decade. This is something brand new because, as I said, weather is only predictable theoretically about two weeks out. Beyond that, chaos takes over, and we can't really predict anything anymore. But there are some aspects in the global climate system, the ocean circulation in El Nino is one of those, where there's a longer time scale associated with it. The characteristics of what we try to predict is different, but still, if an El Nino, and we are predicting an El Nino right now for the coming um, winter, certain parts of the overall expected distribution of rain for Iowa are going to happen. Likely going to happen, not going to happen, but li more likely going to happen than the other part, because El Nino kind of sets the stage for a particular type of circulation. And there are a couple others that tend to go out a little longer in the ocean circulation. We think we could go about five years, maybe a little longer. The models that do this right now are not very good. This is brand new for us, and if you can give us good targets where we can test how good we're doing, we might be able to improve on the seasonal and then to the longer time scale, actually time-dependent predictions. And so in that projection that goes out, that is this broad band between many different models, maybe at least for the first few years, we can put a timeline on it that actually says you're going to be preferentially more on the upper or on the lower end of such a distribution. And therefore, certain types of events, characteristics like extremes, maybe sequences, might be predictable, might be but we need your help because we would look at the wrong thing. So given all this information and looking for an app, this poor guy says, if, you know, if I would have known that you can give me so much information, I would have never asked for it. So we need it much simpler. So what we need to do is an efficient way of going through this that you and I, or you know, you, your community with our community, we can work together can identify very specific things that we want to go after and almost in an operational way start to play games. For the past, trying to see if we can reproduce some of the things that have happened and then see how much into the future we can actually push this predictive or projective skill. And one thing that we were trying to do is that instead of having it to take weeks to go to the supercomputers and download out of these 20 petabytes the, the days of sequence that you want to play with, that it comes like a snap. You can identify, I want, to f I want a year, like we had just now, where there were these cold air outbreaks repeatedly into the Midwest and then over into the East Coast. If you can specify that criteria and it takes 10 seconds to go into the 20 petabyte and find the years where this happens and pull it right out. And this is what's happening in this image on the right side, where we pre-staged on a specially designed computer a huge amount of data and actually went in with a very specific question and pulled this out. The, the, the threshold for, for time is seconds that you would want to wait. If you have to wait a day, you have forgotten your question and we can't really play. And that's what we need to learn, is how do we do that to stage all that data so that we can really work together and very specifically look for new types of seeds and then expose them to very specific climate characteristics and see what the consequences would be. That's where we are. For example, the, um, 
the Asian Development Bank has come to us and asked, can we help build a regional climate scenario library, a collection of climate model data? And we went in and said, we could do that, but you know what? It doesn't really help you. What we need is the librarian with the library, and I hope this is what I was able to communicate to you here. It's not just the data, but we need the, the translation with it, the key evaluation stages that say, how good is this data before you even start playing? Then you get really powerful. That's when all your new seed developments, all your livestock decisions suddenly can be exposed to all sorts of scenarios. We can ask many questions really efficiently. That we need that additional translator. And so we try to do a little something like that in a report with the USDA about climate change and US agriculture. And I have one report here and a couple more over there. And maybe there's a box coming if somebody is interested go in that direction of how we can marry the climate science with agricultural science. And uh, just the keywords in the research needs, data, we need better data, but we need access to them. We need indices, very specific characteristics that you would like, and then we need that app, the guidance of how to use it. It doesn't exist right now, but we, I think from the research community, are really willing and open to work with you to, to uh, translate this properly. And for me, always an interesting thing is this, this map. We often talk about the US, but this is the a map of world population. And if you go even worse, this is the world population that is exposed to natural disasters like climate. And that puts for me the focus where it's supposed to be, I think, where we need to see where our tools really could make a difference, even if it is not that advanced and perfect, but uh, even a little bit can start to make a big difference. And that's what we are trying to keep in mind. And we call this, I'm going to go on, what we call as climate services capabilities. What do we need to do? Instead of just running models, how do we think about delivering <laughs> and connecting to you? And how can we optimize the investments? So thank you for your attention.